Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. Guys, get a load of this. Nobody is talking about this right now. Get a load of what one of the highest profile military men representing the interests of the Kremlin in Ukraine had to say today. It's very telling, very revealing about what is about to happen. Now, Evgeny Prigozhin, who is the head of the Russian Wagner Group. They're like a private mercenary group contracted by the Russian government to fight on the Kremlin's behalf in Ukraine. Right now, they are primarily preoccupied in Bakhmut, which someday may be remembered as the epicenter of the apocalypse, the way things are going. But he was actually at ground zero today, surprisingly. That's one hell of a risky photo op. But supposedly he was at ground zero, so he claims. But he said something very, very revealing that everybody should be paying attention to. He basically told people explicitly exactly what is about to happen. I got to apologize in advance today. No fancy studio, no interactive screen in the background. We're doing this on the fly. I promise you we'll get back to our regularly scheduled higher production deprogramming tomorrow. Anyways, this is what he said. In a video calling for more Russians to join his mercenary group, the Wagner Group boss, Evgeny Prigozhin, says that anybody who signs up to fight with him will be well-placed once World War III starts. And that's not a paraphrase. That's not taking his words out of context. He literally said, recruits will be in good shape for the upcoming World War III if they join now. How's that for an initiative? Now, a lot of people might be asking themselves, why is Russia, a country with 140 million people, reservist numbering at least in 25, 25 million guys, okay, who could get the call at any given time? Why do they have these private mercenary groups doing all the work? Well, it's probably much ado with a lot of legal issues for starters. It's a great way for them to purge the uh, degenerates within their population. So they basically take these guys out of jail. They give them an option. Either you go to the front line or you, you know, you stay in jail. But if you, if you fight on the front line, if you do your tour and if you survive back moot, then, you know, maybe you'll get your freedom when you come back. There's a lot of reasons why they're ex exhausting these guys instead of using the Russian forces, the hundreds of thousands of Russian forces that are just waiting, okay? And he's telling us today, he's telling us exactly what the plan is. Now, if you guys haven't seen the video that we released last year when this whole thing started with Dr. Peter Vincent Price, former CIA, he's no longer uh, with us today. He passed away last year. But he talked about how this whole Ukraine war situation was just Russia preparing for a much broader war. And Prigozhin today basically told us exactly what is going to happen and nobody paid attention because a lot of these guys can be rather bellicose and cantankerous and very hyperbolic at times uh, with respect to Dmitry Medvedev talking about the four horsemen of the apocalypse every other day or Ramzan Kadyrov threatening everybody who's basically, you know, uh, Putin's Chechen pit bull, so to speak. And interestingly, I've realized that the Chechens were doing a lot of the fighting in Mariupol. And now you have a Pergosian who's doing a lot of the fighting in Bakhmut, two of like the biggest, bloodiest battles right? And uh, makes you wonder, well, what are they holding back all their forces for? Why are they holding back all their best weapons and materiel? And these numbers that the Ukrainians are giving, these are not independently verified numbers. I mean, the Russians are saying they lost 75 planes. The Ukrainians are saying they lost 300. So, and, and, and it's not only the Russians saying that, it's just independently verified sources can only verify 75 planes. The Russians have well over like thousands of planes, potentially, and the one, if you include the ones being built, including the Sukhoi 57s, which are kind of like their equivalent of uh, F-22 Raptors, which, of which they're going to have 50 by the end of the next year, according to them. Now, anyways... You really need to understand what he's saying here. 
we're starting to see all the pieces fall into place, okay? You're starting to see the stage being set for a much larger war. And within the last 48 hours, some incredible things have happened. You've had the suspension of the New START Treaty, the official uh, suspension of that treaty. You've had the shakedown at one of the U.S. nuclear silos where two high-ranking commanders and four officers were relieved of their duties for some reason. For some undisclosed reasons, they were relieved from their position. This is something unprecedented. It doesn't happen every day that you have so many people turfed at once. Now, they're saying that it's due to lack of confidence and potential safety oversights security oversights potentially but if you really start to dig a little deep you can do a lot of speculating now understand what i'm about to say is strictly speculation but in that same period of time you have the doomsday plane which i believe is the e6b mercury moved to iceland this is the american doomsday plane that has the ability to be a command and control center once we hit DEFCON 1, once we need the nukes to be sent out from the submarines, this is the plane that is going to send that message out. Now, the simple fact that the treaty has been suspended immediately ratchets up the DEFCON level. That this plane is currently in Iceland is a sign to the Russians that the Americans are potentially preparing for something, or this is how it's going to be interpreted. You see, we as Americans, North Americans, Canadians, Europeans, we don't understand how the rest of the world perceives us. We perceive ourselves as, well, we would never do such, a, we would never initiate a nuclear war. The Russians don't think that way. They very much, I mean, especially when you see the world and what the United States has been involved in since World War II. If there ever was, like if there was an alien species looking at the planet right now, assessing who do you think would be most likely to push the nuclear button, the aliens are without a doubt probably going to select the one country who's already done it before and who's been in a war pretty much ever since World War II. And this is not a slight against my American friends. We realize you're a victim of the military industrial complex, just like us up here with Justin Trudeau. But understand that the rest of the world, that's how they perceive us. Okay? Now, in that same period of time, you've had incursions into Russian airspace as deep as Moscow and possibly St. Petersburg, which is why they had this drill. They shut down commercial flights for a drill. It doesn't happen. Okay, that's another sign that something very serious is going on. There's a lot of birds up in the sky, spy planes right now all around the world, whether they're from the UK Air Force. The UK Air Force has had a large amount of uh, fighter jet activity. I don't know if they're doing training or what, but I've been watching it on flight radar. Something is definitely afoot right now and i know we we say that a lot on this channel but it's just it's escalating guys it's escalating you got poland installing the anti-tank barriers you have things spilling over into moldova you have the chinese likely going to be using belarus as an intermediary to funnel weapons into russia to bypass or make uh sanctions a bit more difficult to be applied you have a lot of things happening at the exact same time and from the russians perspective the suspension of this start treaty some people might just say well it's the russians trying to get a little bit of leverage in the negotiating table if that even comes which it likely won't and i'll talk about the, re the reasons why any negotiation is doomed to fail the only way a war ends is if there's a winner and this is how World War II ended. And some people say, look at how quickly Germany and America and Japan became friends after World War II. Well, it's kind of true. They were kind of occupied as well. But indeed, global trade started again. And the reason why is because things turned over. You know, they lost the war. You lose the war and then it's done. 
But if you have any sort of negotiation right now, any sort of treaty, armistice, whatever it is, it is just going to be preparation time for the next big push. It's just going to be kicking the inevitable can down the road. Somebody has to lose. Now, according to Rio Novosti, this is from Russian, very, very pro-Russian media now. So take it with a grain of salt. But this is how they're interpreting the situation. And remember, you cannot be a Merocentric in your thinking if you truly want to understand how other people in the world perceive us. They are worried that Washington is planning on doing a preemptive strike, that people in Washington actually think they can defeat the Russians in a nuclear war. This is according to them. Now, this could very much be propaganda. And I hear you guys right now. I'm right there with you. I'm skeptical. I'm critical. But, but hear this out. They think that the Americans right now are planning on doing a nuclear strike, destroying 65 to 70% of Russia's strategic nuclear forces in an instantaneous global strike. And you have to imagine yourself being the Kremlin. And seeing all of this activity, seeing NATO, NATO's encroachment and having the history as you do with everybody invading your country, of course you're going to think that they're going to use nukes first. And just last year, we had that slight alteration to the U.S. nuclear doctrine, which is pretty much purely for public consumption, but they got across a few T's and dot a few I's to make it at least uh, semi-legitimate in the international eye. But they think that, um, and this is, this is a, a theory I've heard floated. And this is where it gets kind of weird because you guys know that just recently those commanders were purged from the Minot missile base. The, uh, they, they're in charge of the, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, Minuteman missiles. There was two top commanders and four high ranking officers who were turfed from their positions. Now were they turfed? For the reasons given, citing safety and security oversights, um, citing a lack of confidence in their ability to do their duty. The, the sacking of so many guys at one time is rather unprecedented from what I'm told. So does it mean then that perhaps they're worried, and I talked about this briefly yesterday, that maybe they're worried that those guys aren't going to be able to see the mission through when it comes down to it. Maybe they're trying to ensure that anybody who's turning the keys in there when they get the order is actually going to do it. And uh, maybe they knew that the guys who were in there would not play ball. Again, pure speculation, but just something to think about because understand, the war has to end. Now, from the Wagner perspective, uh, it, it seems like you wouldn't say something like that unless... Like you wouldn't want people to think that the war was going to get worse. That doesn't seem like a motivation to want to join into a fight if you know that it's going to end up as World War Three. It's like you're almost giving people, you know, the 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 better of uh, you're you're giving them an offer that both options suck, but one sucks a lot less, and that's if you join now, we'll make you an officer when the shit really kicks off. What we're waiting to have happen. Peter Vincent Pry, former CIA, the late Peter Vincent Pry, who was on the channel last year, he talked all about how the Russians are fighting this war with their fingers and not their fists. And what he meant by that was that the Russians are aware that there's a bigger war with NATO coming. Hopefully, it's conventional. But people think that, ah, Nuclear war, there's no more reason for tanks. There's no more reason for military. Oh, yes, there is. Oh, yes, there is, especially if you don't buy into nuclear winter and all the other theoretical stuff. It's all theoretical, okay, with respect to nuclear winter and how bad it's going to be. Oftentimes, these things are overhyped. So I would not be surprised if nuclear war is absolutely horrible. But unfortunately, the majority of the Earth's population will still survive, well, at least initially, until, you know, the crops don't grow for a, a few years and uh, perhaps the 
the uh, power goes out across everywhere and the nuclear uh, reactors go into meltdown and the spent spent fuel rods can't be kept cool and all that fun stuff so the russians think that it's the americans who are going to reinitiate nuclear testing okay due to their lack of commitment to the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty recall that the new start treaty was the last treaty so now the russians don't even have to alert the americans as to the whereabouts of the destination of their mobile intercontinental ballistic missiles moscow air defense is getting another facelift they just keep adding more and more air defense you've had those incursions today into russian not only airspace but also a land invasion which is perfectly justified hey if you're invading a country expect to be invaded back the russians are acting like oh, how dare you invade us i mean it, it's like come on man you, you gotta expect that from happening is it going to help the ukrainians probably not probably not it's probably just giving the russians the justification they need to actually start putting Russian troops, like Russian Federation troops, into the fight. Remember, they've been using Wagner. They've been using Kadyrov and the Chechens. The Russian Federation, as far as I know, as far as I'm seeing, is not doing a lot of the really, really meat grinder type stuff. But I could be wrong about that. But that's just what I'm seeing. It's very likely that we are going to see, at some point, attacks on the Kremlin itself. It appears as though that is coming at some point. And what the response is going to be is anybody's guess. Yes, best guess. But the Russians are incredibly reserved and conservative with their responses so far. It's like they, they keep having these red lines overstepped, but they're just not doing anything. And it makes you wonder, is Putin really, really playing a long game of chess here? Or do they really just suck as a military? And I say suck in the sense that not that we would fare much better, to be brutally honest. Um, they're unfortunately, the Ukrainian air defense, which happens to be Soviet air defense primarily, is too good. So the air superiority is just not there because Russian made air defense is you know it's a force to be reckoned with but there's still some they're, they're holding back for some reason they haven't started targeting the capital yet like really targeting like no shock and awe yet why not they easily could unload a barrage of missiles onto kiev which would you know i mean I, I hope it doesn't come to this but i mean they easily could do that so the fact that they haven't done that yet shows you that they're still being far more measured in how they approach this thing. There's a variety of reasons people give as to why they don't want to do that. Historical cities, not wanting to burn down the critical infrastructure. But I don't really believe the, the taking the country intact idea anymore. Because look at the, the destruction that's been caused thus far. And how much longer are you going to prolong your losses just to not have to fix a power grid or a water treatment center when the smoke clears you know what i'm saying so i don't think they can hide behind that argument anymore that it's just that well you know we don't want to damage the critical infrastructure because when we take over the country you know we're going to need that stuff i mean by the time that the, the money they're burning right now in this conflict had they just gone and you know shock and awe in the first place they probably would have saved a lot more money anyways one final story of the day that is worth mentioning is the bird flu mutation. There's been a spillover and apparently the girl who died caught a virus which is better adapted to humans. And they actually think that it's not the first human that this has passed through. Now, this doesn't mean it was human to human transmission, but they can't rule out that this particular strain of bird, through, bird flu hasn't been exposed to a human before. I can't remember exactly how they explained it, but Dr. Eric Carlson, who led the team at the Pasteur Institute of Cambodia, that decoded the genetic sequence of the girl's virus, said it differed from samples taken from birds. There are some indications that this virus has gone through a human. 
he revealed in an exclusive interview. Anytime these viruses get into a new host, they'll have certain changes that allow them to replicate a little bit better or potentially bind to the cells in a respiratory tract a little bit better. Widespread transmission would require a mutation that allows it to bind to a receptor found on the cells in our nasal passageways, as human flu viruses do. In addition to this, China has now reported two more cases of human bird flu, people more than 800 miles apart. So it appears as though it's starting. They're already talking about max vaccination of all the birds and getting ready for the bird flu jab. So it appears as though there's not going to be a dull moment throughout the 2020s. Stay strapped, stay ready. Oh yeah, we can't be strapped in Canada. That's right. That's only for you Americans. Stay strapped, stay ready. Well, for you Canadians, I guess just keep your head on a extra bobblehead swivel and uh, take care, guys, and enjoy every day to the fullest. Remember, be prepared, be aware, don't be scared. Live every day to the fullest. Embrace life and uh, don't live in fear, but just understand things are going to get weird. Take care.